all going to have some version of Jarvis, right? An AI that is in your ear, on your body, and so forth. Frankly, even as someone in AI, I feel like, man, it's tiring. There's so much going on. Physical things in the real world are much further from being disrupted by AI. And it's going to create wealth faster than anything we've ever seen. of AI is that it can analyze information faster than any person. We're just literally starting to explore these. All of us are engaged with governments. We're trying to help them. It's a bit difficult when they're just catching up to the internet right now. Now it's got to the point where this technology could potentially be dangerous. So not everything needs to be open, but we do need to be transparent and careful when stuff gets out of our control. I have to admit, I'm not letting ChatGPT tell me where to invest at this moment. In, <laughs> in school, a lot of kids have been cheating and they've been using ChatGPT to write essays and book reviews and do their math. Cheating implies it's a contest. School should not be a contest. You will never not be without this AI as you grow up. My question is about content creation, especially in music. You will have perfect music models by the end of the year. We believe this technology could be existential and we will treat it as such. One of the greatest drivers for peace on the planet is making sure every mother has their children with the best health and the best education. A more peaceful world for us is a world in which we uplift everybody, which is what this technology has the ability to do. Everybody, this year at Abundance 360, given the meteoric rise of AI, I decided to put together an entire day on AI with three of the most extraordinary thinkers. Uh, you've met one of them, Imad Mustak, the chairman, founder, CEO of Stability AI. Also brought to the conversation, Alexander Wang, who's the founder and CEO of Scale AI. It's a big data machine learning platform that accelerates the development of AI. He founded it when he was at MIT at age 19 as a student, dropped out after the first year to become the youngest self-made billionaire ever. I also brought Andrew Ang, the managing partner at AI Fund. He's co-founder and chairman of Coursera, uh, the founder of Google Brain. I love the name of that. And one of Time's 100 most influential people. Between Imad, Alexander, and Andrew, you can get an overview of this field. How fast is it moving? How disruptive is it? Is it something you should be excited about or fearful of? My massive transformative purpose is to inspire and guide entrepreneurs to create a hopeful, compelling, and abundant future in humanity. And that's what I'm doing with this podcast, to open up every relationship, every conversation I have with you to inspire you, to support you in going big, in helping uplift humanity. If that's of interest to you, please subscribe to this podcast. Allow me to share with you the wisdom that I'm learning from the most incredible moonshot entrepreneurs on the planet. Let's jump into this episode. It's a conversation that everyone needs to be having in your company, in your family, and definitely at the heads of every nation. Enjoy. Thanks, Peter, and thanks to our amazing guests here today. Um, we've been talking about this actually for years uh, when we look at the rapid acceleration of AI and this, this disruption that's kind of happening very, very quickly from this point forward. And, and, and when we look at industries and workers and whether they're getting the, the, the understanding, the knowledge, and the reskilling, that, will, that needs to happen to approach this current world. In what ways do you see or do you believe um, we can do that faster and work with governments and larger corporations and, and education systems to help enable this? Um, because we're all talking about positivity and abundance, um, and I think we're very privileged in this room. And the question is, for the rest of the world, what are we doing? And in what ways um, are you involved as leader. By the way, we've got 40 minutes here, so lots of great questions to be asked. Who wants to take that on? You know, so it's, it's a very important point. I think the world is changing so fast, it's difficult for a lot of people to just keep up with what on earth is going on. Frankly, even as someone in AI, I feel like, man, it's tiring. There's so much going on. Um, so I think maybe one, one of the things I'm doing uh, years ago, I started co-founded Coursera, which to this day offers a lot of courses, often works with governments to train up different, uh, uh, different people 
I think that one nice thing is with um, online education, with digital education, we can speed up the rate at which we help people figure out, you know, learn the new technologies and figure out what to do with it as well. Um, and I think media also has a huge important role to play. And eventually, I would love if we can build tools. Like, if you look at Google, the UI is really simple. The background is insanely complicated. It's just type what you want, and you get answers. So I hope that AI tools can evolve to the point where, you know, you could just use it without nearly as deep of education needed. And I think a lot of the generative AI tools are headed in that direction. Yeah, I think it's super natural. I mean, that's why super, space natural. Like, ChatGPT was so successful because you just type and it just came. Stable diffusion, you just type and then you have images, right? And so I think making these things more and more usable has led to the explosion because it kind of comes from the natural language understanding of humanity itself. It's trained on these large corpuses of an entire media set. I think on the policy side, um, I think all of us are engaged with governments. We're trying to help them. It's a bit difficult when they're just catching up to the internet right now. Um, but By the way, the most linear organizations on the planet, right? If not sublinear. They are, and you know, and again, the typical approach to this is regret minimax, you know, like stop it, ban it. But it's inevitable now, and again, it's kind of a global phenomenon. One of the problems as well is that, you know, you've had an acceleration, but you haven't had a maturation. So there's lots of excitement. How much implementation is there now? There's going to be a bit of a pause because it has to be in the current wave, even as research keeps going. And you go into engineering and application. And so I think we're not sure exactly where things are. And I think Andrew talked a bit about where the value lands on the stack. And again, we are all at kind of at different areas of this stack. Amazing. So we ourselves haven't figured this out. And we're doing our best with the community to try and do that, to communicate to policymakers and make education courses and others accessible. Michael, good to see you. You're next, pal. So this is probably a question more to Imad, but anybody's perspective is welcome. I am uh, done lots of programming. I usually like to think about abstractions or concepts. Uh, you have a concept, let's say drawable, that's fit for some purpose. And so it can do that thing. Now with AI, we're talking to, we are using English language, we're using prompts, so definition what you're asking for is a lot more vague. So, so when it's vague, it may have edge problems, right? You have to clarify things a lot more. And so my question is, do you still see a value in having well-defined, structured, uniquely named things which you can compose for well understood result, or do you think we'll diverge more to everything's a bit fuzzy, everybody just provides a lot more text, and it just somehow the system figured it out for you? Well, I think, uh, that's an excellent question. I think a lot of the applications right now have been very surface level without the contextual awareness of, like, you know, Game of Thrones in South Korea or something like that. Um, Amazon had this thing where they had the six page memos, right, rather than presentations, but another thing they used to do was write the press release beforehand. And so if you write the actual overview of the program in the comments now for kind of Copilot and things like that, or GPT-4, it will write the program based on the comments. You know, So again, I think this is a failure for us to understand prompting and some of these other things. It's something that Andrew and I have been talking about. You know, Again, it's gone so fast, we've got the surface level, we have to explore. Another way to think about this is like game consoles. When the Wii first came out, games were a bit crap. By the end, it was fantastic. We're just literally starting to explore these. So it's simple words now, and then we'll compose and build structures around it to get the most out of these weird thingies. Hey everybody, I want to take a quick break from our episode, tell you about a health product that I love and that I use every day. In fact, I use it twice a day. It's called Seed Health. Now, your microbiome and gut health are one of the most important and modifiable parts of your health plan. Your gut microbiome is connected to your brain health, your cardiac health, your metabolic health. So the question is, what are you doing to optimize your gut? Let me take a second to tell you what I'm doing. Every day, I take two capsules of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. It's a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic formulation that supports digestive health, gut health, skin health, heart health, and more. It contains 24 clinically studied and scientifically backed probiotic strains that are delivered in a patented capsule that actually protects it from the stomach acid and ensures that all of it reaches your colon alive with 100% survivability. Now, if you want to try Seed's Daily Symbiotic for yourself, you can get a 25% off your first month supply by using the code MOONSHOTS at checkout. Just go to seed.com backslash MOONSHOTS and enter the code MOONSHOTS at checkout. 
That's seeds.com backslash moonshots. And use the code moonshots to get 25% off your first month of Seeds Daily Symbiotic. Trust me, your gut will thank you. All right, let's get back to our episode. I want to go to Zoom next, uh, Ned uh, al Sikafi. Ned, where are you on the planet, and what's your question? Hi, guys. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you great. Perfect. I'm from Chicago. Uh, I am in healthcare, and I love the idea of healthcare and longevity. I may be your only practicing physician here. Um, I had the idea of joining this group because as a practicing urologist, we are getting pummeled. And as Peter and, uh, and AI and, and HealthSpan go on, most urologists are going to see people who are older. I think all you guys are going to be a patient of either me or my colleagues here soon. The point I'm making here is that there is an overflow of patients and we as clinicians are getting bombarded. And the question is, in light of workflow, workflow shortages with our, our, our staff and the incoming number of patients, how to use AI most efficiently in terms of point of care for patients getting into our offices, as well as having AI be part of the evaluation process, because as many people may know, you know, 90% of the time we see the, the same 10 conditions. So the, the question to the uh, panelists is, Number one, how would you advise a physician uh, or healthcare provider to set this up? And do you think that this is something that is uh, easily attainable? I, I liked Alex's uh, thought about starting small. And then the second question is, if you were to do it, is it the sort of thing that would prevent, I mean, is there anything in there to prevent others from doing the exact same thing so that if you are spending a lot of time and money into this, that nobody else just kind of scoops it from you? Thank you for taking my question. Yeah. I'll just say real quick, uh, if you have a concrete idea for what you like to do in neurology, let me know. We, you know. I think teams could help, maybe my team could help execute that. And one, one example is something AI funded. Uh, we worked with a fantastic founder, Alison Darcy, and now different CEO, Michael Evers, to um, support building up Wobot, which is a dit digital mental health care chatbot. Um, you could actually install it on your phone that, you know, from the data published out of Stanford, seems to be able to take effect relatively quickly in terms of treating symptoms of um, for, for, for users of symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, so I think that there are actually lots of opportunities to apply AI in interesting ways to healthcare. Um, but figure out those concrete use cases then allows us or you know, others to execute on it. Yeah, I'll say two more things, which is that I think the, the first is that, you know, getting to market first is actually an advantage. You know, certainly other people can copy the idea, but I think... Um, you know, this is one of these things that's well studied in business, but there's going to be a moat from whoever's able to establish the use case first and then able to um, use that pull position to get more and more data into the system. So let's say you built, you know, the best possible system for um, identifying some sort of um, some sort of um, uh, disease or, or condition using AI, then you're going to, just by launching that service, get far more data than anyone else and race ahead of, of where anyone else could possibly be. So the, the, the sort of currency of the realm of AI really is, uh, is data. And if you have a, unique, a niche data set or a unique data set, that's going to give you an initial advantage. And then if you're able to build a strategy, continue amassing more and more data, That'll keep you ahead. We're going to go next to, uh, to John uh, here at Mike 2. Let me remind you, please look at the questions in Slido. Upvote them if you're here in the audience or on Zoom. Uh, we'll be pulling them. John, please, what's okay. your question? And uh, keep the question short if you could. Sure. So I'm a medium to small business owner. I'm a physician. I own a diagnostic laboratory. So I hear a lot of buzzwords. You need to implement AI. You need to create, um, you know, you need to put your data on a balance sheet. That sounds awesome. Uh, but the, but my initial question is, how do you get started going down that road of, you know, we, we have a ton of data, but how do you put it in a package that you can actually monetize it and put on a balance sheet? So what are the process of just going about doing something like that? And then number two, implementing AI into something that I think is a very concrete um, uh US, or like a case point for our company is digitizing pathology and allowing an AI over engine to help pre-diagnose or triage cases or whatnot. How do you go about implementing something like that in a company that's my size 
by either pairing with someone else or do you try to bring a team in to develop it? So like what kind of playbook just to get you off the ground and move your company? Alex, to, I think you're moving that. Yeah, so we have tools. Um, you go to scale.com, we have data set management tools that you can upload all of your data and basically build that into a data set. Um, that's step one is to get all of it into one tool, build up an entire data set, and then you can do a bunch of things from there. You can label and annotate the data, turn it into a data set that you can train a new model on top of. Um, you can uh, bring in a host of companies. We could be one of them, or there's a bunch of other vendors out there that can take that data and turn it into a, a customized model for you, and then um, and then launch it and figure out how, how much impact it can possibly have. But then you find out who that data is valuable to, ultimately. Uh, we're going to go to Slido. There's a great question here. I'm going to send it to you, Imad. It says here, is there any commercial activity which AI will never be able to disrupt? What will be the factors to understand that? I'm I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, right? It's like the question asked of Bezos. What, what won't change, right? There's nothing that will never be able to disrupt it because you'll have autonomous robot agents that basically yeah, it's Blade Runner. <laughs> right, indistinguishable from humans. Uh, so I can't see any commercial activity cannot disrupt. Do you guys agree, uh, Alex? Let's go with you. You know, I think um, I think at least in the short term, and, and who knows, this this stuff could all change. Uh, but in the short term, uh, physical things in the real world are are much further from being disrupted by AI. So you know, anything that we have to sort of like interact with or do something physical in the real world, um, robotics is relatively behind. Uh, a lot of the sort of pure digital, pure online kind of uh, AI systems. So, you know, I don't know if the word is never, but at least for a long time, um, you know, we won't have AI, you know, an AI robot that can do construction or that can do, um, you know, mining or some of these things that are very, uh, very interesting. I, I'm, 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 I go into the, uh, I go into Imad's category here, but that's my opinion. You guys are actually, a Andrew? You know, my, my friends and I, some of my AI tech friends and I, we used to challenge each other, name an industry that AI will not be able to disrupt. So we challenge each other to name that. And I had a hard time coming with them until one day I thought, all right, maybe hairdressing industry, you know. Which industry? Hairdressing. Hairdress. I, I think that's easy. Hair. Um, and, and, I, and I used to say this on stage until one day, one of my friends, who's a robotics professor, she was in the audience when I sat down on stage. And um, afterwards, she stood up, she pointed at my head, and she said, Andrew, for most people's hairstyles, I don't know how to put a robot to cut the hair like that, but your hairstyle, I could tell you a robot to do that. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, uh, we're going to go to Kieran on, on mic four. Do you think uh, with the la large language models like GPT, will they ever be able to explain why they generated what they generated or ah, they need a new breakthrough? So right now you can ask the models to explain why it said what it did. Um, it's not clear if those answers are actually correlated at all with the actual reason why it produced, they, they aren't probably correlated with why they actu uh, actually said that. And so there's sort of, you know, humans have this bug, which is that we will do things, and then if somebody asks us to explain why we did the thing, we'll come up with some post hoc rationalization that oftentimes is not literally the reason why we did a certain thing. Usually it's, you know, there's the analogy of the elephant and the elephant rider, which is that our emotional brain is an elephant and our rational brain is this, is this rider of the elephant that just sort of is trying to explain what the elephant's doing. Um, so I think, I think the large language models are similar, which are that they're going to go through some process by which they make a decision or they say something, and then you can ask it to explain, and it'll come up with something on the spot to try to explain it. Um, you know, this is something that Ahmad and I were actually just talking about, is like, how do you get greater levels of interpretability? How do you, how do we do research in the direction of like, actually truly understanding where it's coming from? But that's all active research. Nice. Giselle, you're the next contestant. Good to see you. Um, so, um, given what has happened to social media, I actually rated the way I feel about AI as scared shitless. <laughs> because you guys, are, you know, you are the leading edge of this. This is your space. Is anybody doing anything to build parameters around this technology so that what you were saying, you met about someone calling you in, in your mother's voice and selling you stock, uh, that is, we already live in a world where we don't know what truth is. How, how are we going to fight this? Yeah. 
Well, I think you see information curation going through social networks. I mean, this is the Twitter verified, it's Apple identity, it's kind of a bunch of other things. We bank contentauthenticity.org, which is a Adobe thing around visual media, but we do need to have centralized repositories of trust because the cost of information becomes zero and creation becomes zero. And unfortunately, there is nothing that can really regulate this output. Like there are laws in various countries that you must identify AI output, like with stable diffusion, there's an invisible watermark of things. But it's become so accessible that we need to have standards quicker than the system is adapting. So this is why I think information distribution systems need to standardize around this right now, which is something we're pushing a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's a big question. Can we even govern against any of this, right? Uh, all of this is bits. We, have, we live in a world of porous borders, data flows. So, uh, at Giselle, we're going to have a lot of these conversations around ethics and uh, around implications. It, guys, this is happening right now, right? This is this year, next year, not 10 years from now, five years from now. What gets played out, this is why we need to be paying such attention uh, to it. Giselle, thank you. I'm sure we'll hear from you a bunch more times. This. Let's go uh, to, uh, to mic number three in the back there, and then I'll go to, uh, we'll go to Zoom, and we'll go to uh, uh, our Slido. All sure. right. Um, my name is Hajime, uh, running an AI startup in Japan, Series D, uh, now getting uh, much closer to the Japanese government. And they're concerning about the disaster and the resilience because uh, there's a huge risk on an earthquake as well as like the Mount Fuji erosions. So uh, my question is, like, what could be the interesting but the practical way to apply AI for those like disaster recovery? So we actually worked on um, something in this direction for in, in the Ukraine conflict, which has obviously been, um, you know, uh, this horrible thing to happen to, to a region and a country. Um, and you're able to, one of the things that um, is really unfortunate in any sort of disaster situation is that, uh, you know, seconds really matter. You know, every second spent that you aren't, you know, deploying resources to help resolve one of the, you know, uh, people who are who are in a damaged structure or uh, you know tackle a certain area is is going to result in either lives lost or further damages to infrastructure. So one of the things that you can do with uh, a combination of satellite imagery plus drone imagery on in major cities or major areas that are being impacted is use AI to automatically identify damage on a building by building level and a change in in that damage um, in every area and use that to coordinate humanitarian response. So. Um, this could be applicable, you know, this is applicable in any sort of natural disaster, um, any for, sort of scenario where fast action really matters. The beauty of AI is that it can analyze information faster than any person. Yeah, we're doing a variant of stable diffusion for satellite imagery and time series data as well. And so that I'm sure will be used in that toolkit. Yeah, amazing. All right, uh, to our Zoom audience, we're going to you next. Uh, Nico, um, N Nico uh, Dranek, uh, where are you on the planet and what is your question? Hi, Peter. I'm calling in from Austria, from Europe. Beautiful. I have a question, have a question um, regarding the profile of a chief AI officer. So what private uh, profile should this AI officer have to fulfill this role best? Um, should it be technical? Should it be another profession? Should it be a mix? Because it seems to me that combines a lot of traits that are found in entrepreneurs and CEOs anyway. So what else is needed? And I ask this specifically coming from a non-tech traditional background as law, in my case. Thank you. And, and Nico, yes, great question. Let me preface a second. What my advice as a first step for folks is, I like the idea of get your team to experiment and so forth. But in my, what's been working for me is finding somebody who knows the field out there, understands who to partner with, is advising as a strategic advisor to the CEO about the platforms and, and such as a chief AI officer in that regard. Do you guys agree with that idea? And what would be uh, your, you know, uh, what do you think that person should have as, as background? Yeah. So actually, as far as I know, I think I might have been the one that coined the term chief AI officer. I stole it from you then. <laughs> no, but, but, but so actually years ago, I actually wrote an article in Harvard Business Review. I remember Googling for chief AI officer didn't really exist on the internet. So I actually wrote a piece in Harvard Business Review with my specific recommendations for the chief AI officer profile. Um, I think person needs to be technical enough to understand the tech and then also business oriented enough to work cross-functionally to figure out what are the valuable business use cases for your specific 
web application, but I have like a multi-page article on, on HPR uh, talking about I mean, I would imagine the CEO or the, or the head of whatever division says, this is what I think is possible, this is what I need. The chief eye officer is sort of an interface to the world out there to bring in a scale, to bring in part of what uh, uh, Imad, what you're building. Does that sound like a reasonable role in a company? Yeah, I think I'll have to be technical enough to make good judgments and then also to make the, you know, buy versus build decisions. And often for many companies, you should buy a lot and build a little bit. But to make those decisions requires both deep technical judgment as well as um, the ability to figure out, understand the business well enough to figure out the, the use, use cases. Imad, I can't tell if you're agreeing or disagreeing. No, I, th I think so. I think that there's an implementation side of it, like an applied engineer is a good thing. I think passion is kind of key, because yes. you have to throw yourself, otherwise there's no way you can keep up. Actually, my suggestion would be that, um, given this suggestion that you have, there should be an internal A360 repository around the ecosystem, the latest trends and others, that can go to all the chief uh, officers here, yeah. so they can keep on touch through that. Okay. All right, Steve, you heard it. <laughs> You're in charge. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you. I, I hope, uh, Nico, that, that answered your question. Let me go to Slido next, and thank you. Some great questions. Uh, uh, Katie, I, didn't, I, I apologize. I didn't uh, note your, your, your name earlier. Um, actually, what is the first step companies can take to evaluate the data they have? Uh, how can we get started extracting uh, from the systems we have in place today? Yeah, so I think the first thing to do right now, the, the new large models are, are um, quite capable of just sort of um, ingesting in existing data you have in basically whatever format you have. You know, in some cases it can be literally as simple as, as uploading a bunch of PDFs uh, <laughs> into, into the models and, and sort of extracting all the information from there. So I think the by, first- By the way, it's something you just said is very important, right? It's like you can almost upload anything if it's text, right? Yes, Your Outlook text. files, everything. Well, yep. soon images as well. Soon images, yeah. And, and images. Multimodal. Text and images, yeah. Yes. It, it, just, just one one point of caveat. It turns out a lot of enterprises have what's called structured data, which means basically giant Excel spreadsheets. So structured data, you know, models like ChatGPT and so on are less directly well suited for, but text and images is getting really good. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yes. Uh, right uh, now, general models still still worse at uh, at Excel than, uh, than, than many of us. But, um, but yeah, so these, these are the data formats. You know, I would basically start the initial process, just catalog, catalog all this data that you would want to upload into an AI system and then, um, and then reach out to one of us to, to help, you, <laughs> uh, I, I, help you put it into to an AI system. Yeah. I want to go to Christy's question on, uh, on Slido here. And I'm heading this towards you, Imad. Uh, uh, if you had to put all of your money, your family's money, your friend's money into one of the technologies here or industries, which one would you put it into? <laughs> Cha-ching. <laughs> uh, I'm all about risk diversification. No, I mean, um, it's an incredibly hard thing to say. Um, my thing is that, like, what I advise all the young people is, actually I'm advising young people, don't go to university anymore, do PhDs. Yeah, I mean, I, and don't get an MBA. What go, do go work. The, the thing can get a GRE, right? Already. So I think, you know, put it into Andrew's fund. I think it'll do well. Um, but there are very few kind of options here apart from you have to use it to basically upskill yourself. This is the thing. Or upskill your community. Or upskill invest in your yourself, group. invest in your company. It, this is literally the case because this is such a disruptive, massive game changer. Um, and there are no easy ways to do that other than like, actually, let's spend money reasonably quickly to get up to speed on this technology because you will have an edge over everyone else. As Alexander said, it's first to market. In the stock market itself, there are no real investable things here at the moment. Are we going to see the first trillionaires in this area? Uh, most likely. Is this where the greatest wealth creation is going to happen? Or are we going to see that in Bitcoin first? Yeah, I think we see this. Uh, I think, again, like Bitcoin had the GPU, and then it had an ASIC era. We're at the GPU era of this technology, but it's real. And we're going to go to ASIC, so it's going to be everywhere and it's going to create wealth faster than anything we've ever seen. Uh, I call it the dot .ai bubble, actually, um, which is why I'm not joking. Like, you know, if you have funds that are focused on this, it's almost a rising tide wave lifts all boats. You know, even if you have the alpha side, that will come through. Like, a trillion dollars will go into this. Like, 20 billion went into delivery startups last year. A total, I think, probably of six billion has gone into this sector to date. A hundred billion has gone into self-driving cars. A trillion went into 5G. Yep. 
just amazing. anything here that's investable. Let's you go to Farzam next. I want to add oh, one sorry. thing to what, what Imad said about jumping in. The decision only arises. I think some people, sometimes people think, am I too late? And, and the answer is you're not. You're actually very early still. AI on, you know, don't know if it's exponential or some very rapid growth, but if you jump in now, I think you look back a few years from now and people say, wow, you know, that my buddy over there was really early jumping in. It, because, it's, it's, because it's still growing so rapidly. It, it's Bitcoin. It's literally six billion. It's going to go to 600 billion in the next few years. It's 100 times increase, right? This episode is brought to you by Levels. One of the most important things that I do to try and maintain my peak vitality and longevity is to monitor my blood glucose. More importantly, the foods that I eat and how they peak the glucose levels in my blood. Now, glucose is the fuel that powers your brain. It's really important. High, prolonged levels of glucose, what's called hyperglycemia, leads to everything from heart disease to Alzheimer's to sexual dysfunction to diabetes, and it's not good. The challenge is all of us are different. Uh, all of us respond to different foods in different ways. Like for me, if I eat bananas, it spikes my blood glucose. If I eat grapes, it doesn't. If I eat bread by itself, I get this prolonged spike in my blood glucose levels. But if I dip that bread in olive oil, it blunts it. And these are things that I've learned from wearing a continuous glucose monitor and using the Levels app. So Levels is a company that helps you in analyzing what's going on in your body. It's continuous monitoring 24 seven. I wear it all the time. It really helps me to stay on top of the food I eat, remain conscious of the food that I eat, and to understand which foods affect me based upon my physiology and my genetics. You know, on this podcast, I only recommend products and services that I use, that I use not only for myself, but my friends and my family, that I think are high quality and safe and really impact a person's life. So check it out, levels.link slash Peter. We give you two additional months of membership and it's something that I think everyone should be doing. Eventually this stuff is gonna be in your body, on your body, part of our future of medicine today. It's a product that I think uh, I'm gonna be using for the years ahead and hope you'll consider as well. I've been uh, sitting here and really blown away with uh, all the great technology AI and, and uh, I'm in a business of uh, in, uh, real estate, which is, I'm not, playing in that arena, but I'm here to find out what I need to do. But what I'm, what I'm actually brought me up to, to the uh, How many folks here. are in real estate here? Raise your hand, please, just get a sense. So you're not alone. Okay, thank you. But my main question is really comes back to the uh, sort of a, uh, what do we do with all these great things and how do we hack the world of peace in, around the world? And how do we uh, understand with the data that it's the need of what Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, what is their problem? What are their challenges? What are the stuff that they want to blow everything up? And what is our problem? And what, how do we look at ourselves as a citizen of the planet Earth? <clears throat> and how do we work with the geniuses we have in front of us to really be able to bring this thing because there's a lot of not cool things we're here around the world. All right, we got your question. How do we save humanity? Well, that's an easy one, right? Thank you. Seriously, uh, I mean, the, the, and, and, and Imad, please dive in because this is something you care deeply about. These are universal translators. Go to ChatGPT, pay something and say, write it from the perspective of a Tea Party conservative, it'll do that. And then you'll say, rewrite it from the perspective of a libertarian and it'll do that. So you're going to have the ability very soon, we're all going to have some version of Jarvis, right? An AI that is in your ear, on your body, and so forth. And that AI will be able to tell you, are you being biased in this conversation? Because it can look at the conversation from other points of view, right? I think one of the greatest drivers for peace on the planet is making sure every mother has their children with the best health and the best education. If you are educated, if you're healthy, if you have opportunity, you're not going to want to throw your life away. A more peaceful world for us is a world in which we uplift everybody, which is what this technology has the ability to do. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think there's one more thing as well. It comes to a trusted third party. When you have a disagreement with someone and you have someone trusted between you, then a lot of this stuff that can speak both your languages, as it were, understands both your contexts. So again, this is the hope now that we have this universal translator, not for language, but for stories, context, and other things. 
We just got to build it right and make sure it's distributed as opposed to centralized and controlled with one specific worldview. I'm going to ask a question and jump in here. Open AI's approach right now, uh, and you know, Elon tweeted the other day that I guess Open AI dismissed or Microsoft dismissed their ethics committee or some something like that. Uh, is there a general sense in the community of concern uh, around that, or is that not a valid concern? Thoughts? I'm not tweeting this out. And if well, you don't, want to I, well, I think uh, one thing I'll just speak for everyone. I think we all have to admire what OpenAI has done. You know, the um, the work in large models was has really been driven by by OpenAI, and um, kind of as I mentioned before. I, I shouldn't say that all of AI was on the wrong track, but certainly um, we were not as focused on large models and the incredible capabilities that we get from these large models, if not for open AI. Um, and you know, I think so far they've been very responsible in their deployment of the technology. Um, uh, I think they've been very thoughtful. They've, they've invested a lot into research to, to make sure that these models are deployed um, safely. And I think they have a very, you know, it's a hard thing for any organization to do to build such incredible capability that has never existed before and, and try to deploy it safely. So. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like the easy answer would be to say, oh, we need to be super concerned about ethics and it's all going south or it's all going poorly. Um, I think we do need to be really concerned about ethics and responsible AI. And to be really pragmatic, I think when Ima released his model, which is fantastic, love what he did. Um, I think that Yima had a lot of flack about how could you release this thing like that? But net net, I'm sure some of the models was used for negative use cases, but I think Yima created massively more value than harmful use cases. So I think that we should be very clear eyed about the problems and the harm and do our best to mitigate that. And then also be clear eyed about the huge benefits, you know, that releasing these models and all the wealth and abundance that this also creates. And that trade off is a very tricky one. And, and I, I do see many highly ethical, well meaning AI teams agonizing over that. Yeah, I think I agree with kind of both. And, you know, as Alexander said, amazing technology and it's been really a breakthrough that allows now humans to scale and they've been at the core of it. Um, like, I have disagreements with OpenAI. Uh, my core one is just a case of now it's got to the point where this technology could potentially be dangerous. Like, as we scale more, we don't know exactly how it works, and so I'd love for them to be responsible. To, to be have more open. Transparent governance, transparent kind of procedural stuff, and again, really adhere to a very strong charter. They don't have to release their models. You can have proprietary models, like I funded the beta of Midjourney, and if you look at Midjourney version 5, it's amazing. I said you never have to open source it because it's great for humanity to be creative, you know? So not everything needs to be open, but we do need to be transparent and careful when stuff gets out of our control. In their own AI AGI, the Artificial General Intelligence document, they say, we believe this technology could be existential and we will treat it as such. We believe this technology could be I was surprised humanity. when I read that as well. So in that case, you should be transparent and you should be really transparent about your governance. Extra, more than anyone, similar to companies that can affect the environment. Hey everybody, this is Peter. A quick break from the episode. You know, I'm a firm believer that science and technology and how entrepreneurs can change the world is the only real news out there worth consuming. I don't watch the crisis news network I call CNN or Fox and hear every devastating piece of news on the planet. I spend my time training my neural net the way I see the world by looking at the incredible breakthroughs in science and technology, how entrepreneurs are solving the world's grand challenges, what the breakthroughs are in longevity, how exponential technologies are transforming our world. So twice a week, I put out a blog. One blog is looking at the future of longevity, age reversal, biotech, increasing your health span. The other blog looks at exponential technologies, AI, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain. These technologies are transforming what you as an entrepreneur can do. If this is the kind of news you want to learn about and shape your neural nets with, go to demandis.com backslash blog and learn more. Now back to the episode. All right, we're going to go to Zoom next. Uh, Charles, uh, where are you on the planet and what is your question? 
So I'm in Palm Beach, Florida. I welcome all of you to come down and visit. Uh, most of us from New York have already left the city, and uh, we're reestablishing ourselves here. <laughs> this is going to be very specific, because, Andrew, you asked us to be specific. So uh, this is actually addressed to you and, and, and perhaps to Peter as well, if he wants to chime in. But how do you use AI or ChatGPT to recommend an investment for your venture fund? You have a lot of inputs, a lot of variables. In, in, in my business of investing, there are too many variables to do it. So if this is a thumbs up, thumbs down, are we going to invest in this company? How do you do it using AI? Thank you. Great right. question. So I think ChatGPT is amazing. I play a bit building multiple businesses using it. I have to admit, I'm not letting ChatGPT tell me where to invest at this moment in time. <laughs> maybe it gets much smarter. Well, well I, I won't mind, you know, maybe it'll replace me and I'll retire, but not yet there. Um, maybe I, the, the reality is making an investment decision or a decision to build a business is so complex and so multifaceted. Um, I don't know we have the mechanisms to even digitize all of that data right now. And even if we have the ability to digitize all that data, I think that while very exciting progress is being made to improve the reason reasoning capabilities of large language models, I think it'll still take a while to get through the very complex multi-step reasoning that I think investors are using to make decisions. By the way, I remember one of the founders of Google Ventures, who is a friend, he's not there anymore, told me that Google Ventures actually had built algorithms for making decisions on who they invest based upon where the company was based, what years established, a whole bunch of other parameters. I don't think they're doing that anymore, but it's an interesting idea. But with that, let me go to Madhu. Who's going to have a brilliant question for us, Madhu? All right. Uh, speaking of positive use cases, I'm going to play out a scenario, and I want to hear from all three of you if that's possible. Um, I'm a large health system. Right? I've done the sick care for all of our existence. And I'm trying to build a chatbot that supports our nursing staff or our triaging staff. And I have all this proprietary data. The specific question is, what foundation models should we start with? If my team's working on this project, what foundation models should we start with? Imad, do you want to start? Um, yeah, you'll be able to use stable LM and stable chat soon. Right now, probably it's going to be um, GPT Neo JNX on kind of that side of things. And that would be the open models that you can use inside your cloud or on prem. Uh, for the proprietary ones, I'm not sure. Like, Cla is Claude available yet? Privately available. Privately available, yeah. So basically, the next generation of language models aren't coming via APIs just yet. So right now, the people that we know in the healthcare industry, they use um, GPT-NeoX and T Plan T5, uh, precisely. Um, but there's no real services around that. Again, we're still in the research to engineering phase, but in the next couple of months, you'll have services that enable you to do this far more seamlessly than before, including the uh, Microsoft uh, GPT-4 chat service as well that you can fine tune on. Yeah, L Llama as well. Uh, I'd mention Llama, although... I yeah, it's non-commercial, that's the problem. Yeah. Right. Um, but internal, well, I, regardless, yeah. um, I think I think one thing that's critical that uh, that Ahmad uh, is sort of implicitly mentioning is that um, on health data, you're very likely going to need a model that you can control and own uh, because there's a lot of PHI and PII that's going to go into these models. Um, so because of that, I think these sort of offerings where, uh, you, you know, you have to give data to another service are probably not workable. So, um, so I think you probably need to take one of these open source models of which Ahmad named a bunch, Llama's a new one from Meta, and, and a host of others, and, and train them up. While choosing the right LM language model is important, I feel like um, a lot of, when, when I think, so AI Fund, we recommend to different companies what language model to start building on top of. So these trade-offs with the model size and cost, and do you want to fine tune, or do you do prompting, or do you constantly, there are all these things, but I feel like the language model is important, but my mind is also going to a lot of the decisions you need to make after choosing a language model, and the processes to execute those well. So, yeah. All right, we're going to go to my deputy son over there. Hi, Bear. What's your question, buddy? Um, so I'm a kid, so I still go to school. And um, in school, a lot of kids have been cheating or cheating. And they've been using ChatGPT to write essays and book reviews and do their math. And I guess my question is, how do you, one, how do you think like schools should evolve to deal with that? Or do you think that it's really declared cheating if it's a tool that we're going to be able to use later on? Brilliant question. Let's give it up for Bear here.
you know, to me, that's a big question of transparency. It's a great question. Thank you for asking that. I feel like um, if you use ChatGPT and you're willing to openly tell the teacher, I'm using it, and the teacher says you can use it, that's fully transparent. That doesn't feel like cheating. To me, the thing that is concerning is if students do it, but the rules requires or leads them to hide it and that kind of, I'm going to do it, but I can't tell them about it. That's, that's what doesn't feel very good. And candidly, schools are struggling. Um, the debate is people will be able to use these tools in the future, so, so we train them to use it, or is it a crutch that will limit right, a person's growth? I have a controversial opinion. So I have a four-year-old daughter trying to teach her math, and because she's four years old, I could stop her from using her calculator. I just don't buy her calculator. So she's learning to add with her own brain. One of the challenges of chat GPT is, you know, most students using it are in an age where parents and teachers don't have an ability really to easily stop as used, and so it does concern me would be a crutch that stops people from doing certain things. Um, or, or, because I love to, I use calculators, but I feel like maybe learning to add with other calculators is useful. So figuring out what we need to do with child GV and educational system is something I see a lot of schools struggling with. I wish I had an answer. Yeah, I've got something to so, uh, Cheating implies it's a contest. School should not be a contest. You know? Got it. Um, so, I think most schools are basically childcare systems mixed with status games. I think schools should embrace this technology and they should really think, how can we impart knowledge into individuals? How can we impart critical systems? Because again, you will never not be without this AI as you grow up. And you have to prepare for that. Awesome. Uh, we have three minutes left. I'm going to do the following. I'm going to ask you to mention your questions very briefly and we'll do a speed round. Uh, Karthik, what's your question in, in 20 seconds or less? Thanks, Peter. And gentlemen, thank you so much for your brilliant insights. Quick, uh, short. What's your question? My question is about content creation, especially in music and arts. Okay. Uh, Ellen, what's your question? Privacy. Very short. Privacy and AI in uh, healthcare information. Okay. Ben, what's your question? Uh, should my 15-year-old continue taking Python, and should he go to college? Okay, so we've got uh, privacy, we've got, say again, Karthik? Uh, creation of music and arts. Creation of music and arts. Okay, ah. ask your question, answer what you want. Uh, yes to Python, yes to college. Okay. Yes to Python, yes to college. Okay, uh, creation of music and art. Uh, music has had its, or has its stable diffusion moment, audio LM and others. You will have perfect music models by the end of the year. Ellen's question again, privacy in terms of healthcare. Uh, uh, I think this is a really big topic, privacy of data when it comes to AI systems. I think that this is going to be probably the biggest uh, regulatory battle when it comes to AI is what data is allowed to be used to train these models and what are the sort of, what consent do you need to get over data and people's data to be able to train models on top of them. Um, I think it's a really big societal topic that we're all going to wrestle with over the next few years and um, I... Uh, I, I, I encourage everyone to get involved if you have an opinion. I think um, also AI for healthcare has to be auditable and interpretable as a medical device typically. So it's going to have to be based on open foundations for that particular use case. Nice. All right, Harry and Babs, what are your last two questions here? Uh, real quick. ChatGPT asks, what measures can be taken to counter the misuse of AI by countries like China? Okay, we're going to talk about China in our next session. So hold your question for that. Babs, close us out. I was going to ask about the evil empire using the ch <laughs> our AI against us. We're talking about ethics and all that kind of stuff. They're not into ethics. Okay, we're going to be talking <laughs> about ethics and empathy and U.S. versus China in our very next session. I'm going to try and keep us on time. Let's give it up for these incredible individuals.